Good afternoon or good uh, evening wherever you are. This is Saturday, August 26th and 20, or Sunday, August 27th. And we're doing our Bucky Critical Path study and review. And how are you feeling tonight? And what do you expect to get out of today's out of this call today? Um, thank you, um, Kate. As usual, very grateful to be here. Um, and I am I'm, I'm halfway listening to the silicon blockade. You know, I was reading the article on that, uh, and uh, it's like uh, you, you're you know in the movies that you watch, right? You have this whole massive. Um, war like thing going on that nobody even knows about right yeah. so yeah so that's where i am and um you know the more i hope that we can get more and more people to actually uh do the right thing in particular with um with the, the kind of things we're discussing yeah so we know around the world people are aware of uh but mr fuller and the things that he's talking about that he's talked about for so long um it's, it's more about how to get more people aware and to be able to do something about this more constructively rather than destructively, okay? Livingry rather than weaponry, etc. cetera. So um, Manu, um, how do you feel and what would you like to take away today? I feel good. I feel alive and grateful. Really, um, what I'm expecting is uh, that we continue on the path that we started, or the critical path, and really, really making it and seeing how relevant it is today, and using it to do as and say the right things. As many individuals as possible, being educate, educated and making educated choices that are right to enable us to improve this planet of ours, our condition on this planet of ours, and also really to not to impair too much the conditions for the generations to come. So that is my expectation. Uh, Joe, how do you feel? I'm happy that uh, I heard your dad is back home and that- uh, Thank you. Find why you know, the last crisis was, and really, I'm. I hope you find you 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 feel good, and what do you expect you? Uh, I do. I feel better. Thank you, Manu, for saying that. I I um, that means a lot. Uh, yeah, they they found the 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 source. It's it is cancer, but at least it's the source that they can identify. Um. And see what they can do. Uh, so I feel very grateful, and, um, and my gratitude is even deeper in the sense that you uh, 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 acknowledged uh, uh, my father and, and the relief that you felt uh, for me. Uh, that means a lot. Um, and uh, thank you, everybody, again, as being here. I feel grateful that. Everybody's here. I, I really do enjoy this group and, and these couple of hours that we had together. Um, you know, the, the, I was actually thinking about Critical Path a little bit this week. And um, particularly, actually, one of my takeaways last week, which was uh, how uh, corporations in foreign countries are actually funded um, with foreign aid. I, I thought that that was, uh, that was really... I thought about the ramifications of that um, and what that means for foreign policy and how that uh, uh, you know, actually puts a, a country in a, in, a, in a difficult position that receives foreign aid. Um, anyway, it, it was really interesting. Uh, and throughout, I was actually, the other part I was thinking about critical path was, uh, you know, understanding the historical uh trends that economic trends specifically that have um that had led to where we are uh but also some of the trends that also uh that made us what we are 
as far as some of the, you know, the early um, entrepreneurs and then the separation of entrepreneurs from the products they produced uh, has been, I think, one of the more um, more interesting things that I thought about. And so the good aspect of it is the entrepreneurship and people wanting to create value for other people. The negative is obviously is when they get separated from creating that value. So mm-hmm. I think that that's, that's a really uh, been illuminating. And I think in different ways, we've been going over this relationship uh, between the media and the government and uh, the military and the government and, and corporations and the government um, and uh, some of the um, uh, negative consequences of those actions. And, uh, but that's not to say those partnerships uh, weren't productive at certain points and can't be productive again uh, in addressing some of the world's most pressing problems. Uh, so anyway, uh, so I think that this has been a really interesting book. It's really made me think a little bit, and uh, I'm looking forward to going through it a little bit more with you guys. Um, Steve, how do you feel? What do you take away from today? Or what do you want to take away from today, I should say? Yeah, well, um, it's interesting because that article on the silicon blockade thing talks all about China and this technology and how, you know, there was first this globalism where everything was being spread out and basically American industry was trying to lower its labor costs. And so they spread out all over the planet. And now all of a sudden we're coming to a stage where because this technology is spread out all over the planet, the United States security, there's always been an issue about U.S. interests and the U.S. interests have uh, gotten the CIA uh, because of U.S. interests, the CIA has been involved in a lot of things they probably shouldn't have been involved in. Uh, But Gee, some of the technologies for these chips, the machines that build them are only built in Germany. And then those machines were shipped to Taiwan and Taiwan is building the most important, you know, the chips. And now the U.S. has has stopped those chips from going into uh, China. And even though they're saying they wouldn't send their troops into into, uh, Taiwan to protect Taiwan, that's where all of our chip factories are. And so now they're talking about bringing the chip factories back to the United States. And it's, you know, this whole all the things that are going on. And then we talk about, Anne mentioned something about good people. Right now, Trump is being indicted. That's five different um, indictments going on in five different states. And uh, I heard a thing on the judge uh, who is over the Atlanta thing, over the Atlanta trial. And they did a profile on her and what an upstanding citizen she is. And, you know, and you talked about there are good people that have to do something. She's one of those good people. Mm-hmm. I mean, she's a justice or she's been a judge. She was, uh, she's a conservative mm-hmm. judge, I think even appointed by Trump, maybe even. But like she jogs five and a half miles a day and, you know, the Secret Service can't keep up with her and she doesn't uh, hanky panky around. I mean, she's a straight up person. And I'm I think that's the what Bucky talks about, the whole thing is having individuals stand up and be straight up people. Um, I've been thinking a lot about the ontology of of profit or the um, the nature of capitalism. And, you know, uh, Joe, you mentioned there an article came through where uh, the IRS. Uh, shoot, I can't remember who it was. In fact, I looked I woke up in a frenzy this morning thinking about it. The, the IRS, the United States Treasury Department, gave a $1.9 billion tax refund to a company that made $4 billion profit. I mean, uh, you know, I, I, and I thought, well, you know, I'd like to look at that company's assets, what their expense profile looks like, what their gross income is, what their what percentage of their profits are employed or of their expenses are employee expenses. How well, you know, there's more than just how much profit you made and how much of a tax refund you get from the IRS that determines whether a company's a good citizen or not. But it's so complicated. Mm. And Bucky is describing some very, very complicated um, things. And it seems like, and this weekend, this week, I saw. Th- I went to the movie three times. I almost went four times. There's a movie called Landscape of the Invisible of of Landscape of Invisible Hand, and it's a kind of independent movie about uh, the world 
about an alien aliens uh, come to the world and and they show people how to make a profit and so uh, although some countries try to battle against them that the the human technology is totally frivolous compared to these aliens and uh, who do anti-gravity everything and know what's going on and they look like little spam little square cubes of spam with four legs they walk around like a dog and have snail eyes and the whole the u.s just the world turned itself over to these aliens because it showed them showed it it showed humans how to make more money and as a result the one percent moved to a city floating up above, above the sky and everybody on the planet is like living in tents I mean, it's just an absolute commentary on artificial intelligence, what's going on with our economies. And it's kind of like a Buckminster Fuller um, uh, kind of an expose. It's really quite good. And uh, I just, I, so I'm full of uh, amazement as we read Buckminster Fuller and see how sensitive he was, he, he was and is to these, um, to the situation that we're just seeing so much ready at hand today. So. I'm sorry for rambling, but that that's what's going on for me. So um, um, so anyway, so we we can go ahead and start our start our reading, I suppose. Um, I was, I would suggest that we set to finish at least part part one because it's really really. I mean, I don't know. I don't want to steal the thunder, but it's so relevant. If you if you have picked if I had a a peak view on at uh, at the end of it is fantastic in terms of just a few pages though you know from page one to well, one we on the stop last time to one twenty at least that we read that yes well let's, let's hope we can I mean we'll read as quickly as we can the next section part two is entitled self disciplines of Buckminster Fuller where, and he, where he basically gives us an, a resume, an outline or a resume, and it would be nice uh, to complete there, but you know, I think we should read and have our conversation and and we'll see if we're lucky enough and do that. Hopefully Mono will do that. No, I'm just saying part one. That's mm -hmm. my, that was my wish. Well, I you know. know Self-discipline, you know, yes, if we can start that, if we can introduce uh, into it, that, that would be fun. But but let's make the effort to, to finish. Oh, we'll just this. wait. There. We'll end there tonight and end part one tonight without starting part two. Is that what you're suggesting? No, I mean, it was, no, no, I'm not saying so. I say at least we end part one tonight. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. as long as we, and there are only like, I guess, eight pages. One, two, three, four, five, one, six, seven, eight, nine pages. So we've been averaging around 10 to 12 pages a week. So that that's likely... Let's get started so that, that can be a possibility. Um, uh, I can, <clears throat> I don't mind starting. Okay, go ahead then. It is relevant at this point to note that, our, that the Arabs, inadvertent isolation of both the physical wealth items, the underlining monetary gold and the prime negotiable energy commodity, petroleum, and their concurrent discovery of their utter lack of know-how clearly differentiated out the relative values of a the uh, purely physical petroleum and gold and b the exclusively metaphysical know-how wealth it turned out that b was most in demand as well as uh, uh, scarcest the physical wealth was thus pr proved to be of approximately zero value, while the, the metaphysical know-how wealth proved to be the prime economic good health constitute of wealth, a constitu uh, constituent of wealth, give me. Moreover, those who own oil also own the atomic energy and have long ago assumed that if humanity exists or, or abandons oil, it will automatically switch over to atomic energy. Humanity has nothing to say about all this because the know-how was so obscure in the lawyer's stratagem, so invisibly large. The lawyer's uh, omni-legal international stratagems were and, were and as yet are so obscure 
in fact, that no government authorities, let alone the public, knew the world energy monopoly scientists had not taken into account earthquakes, for instance, in the construction of new atomic plants, nor had the public or the government anticipated that the intuitive wisdom of humanity would develop such an uh, antipathy to ec atomic energy as eventually to force lawyer capitalism to fall back on its ownable coal mines and shale for con uh, conversion into pipeable and meterable liquid fuels. It is as yet inscrutable to the public, government, and lawyer capitalism just how strong literate humanity's intuitive wisdom will be in preventing the full-scale conversion of coal and shale into liquid energy fuel when it learns, as it has now been learned in a scientifically undeniable way, that this selfishly exploitable energy fuel strategy will inexorb inexorably destroy the atmosphere's capability of supporting biological life on planet Earth. Like all fossil fuels, coal gives off carbon dioxide when burned, but coal gives off 25% more of its per unit of energy. I need to Wait move. Yeah, pardon me. I just was over here infatuated by this term, lawyer capitalism. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, then oil and 50% more than natural gas. Although carbon dioxide comprises less than 1% of the Earth's atmospheric gases, this concentration has risen 17% since pre-industrial times and is expected to rise an equivalent amount in the next 20 years. The greenhouse effect from the, from the sun's heat and increasing amounts of, of this otherwise harmless gas could send average global temperature soaring by as much as six degrees Fahrenheit within 50 years, according to a US government study. This unprecedented global environmental ca catastrophe would be virtually irreversible for centuries. No one knows whether the uh, uh, cessation, cessation yep. uh, of the waste radi. Did I say that correctly? Yes. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, of the waste radiation of atomic energy exploitation, uh, or yeah, exploitation, or the cessation of coal and shale conversion into fluid fuel will occur in time to permit the physical continuance of humans on planet Earth. What we do know, however, as we have previously stated, is, is one, that with the unselfish use of technology, it is now possible to take care of all humanity at a higher standard of living than any and than any have ever experienced and do so on a sustaining basis by employing only our daily energy income from sun and gravity and two that we do so in time to permit the healthy continuance of humans on planet earth uh, now things are beginning legally piggly uh, now things are beginning to go wrong with atomic power generation everywhere to start off, when neither the scientists nor the atomic plant private enterprise owners have any safe solution for what to do with radioactivity atomic wastes. Humanity's in in intuitions are logically aroused and public antipathy of, to atomic energy is rapidly expanding. Despite billions of dollars being spent by the world energy cartel in propaganda campaigns to make the vast majority of people go for atomic energy. The second great gasoline line, Pench, of June 1979, was put upon the public by the invisible energy know-how cartel to painfully divert the public concern generated by the Three Mile, by the three mile Island radiation accident and threat of a reactor meltdown. Though the public had reacted strongly against atomic plants, 
the sudden energy supply squeeze administered by the oil companies made it made the general public so energy hungry again that it stopped for the moment listening to those who were who were attempting to curtail atomic energy plants the gas crisis reestablished rational public yielding to governmental support of atomic energy as the answer to the energy crisis Today's 1980 world power structures struggle is one between the USSR and big capitalism, which we now call lawyer capitalism, which deliberately took the world's private enterprise corporations out of the fundamental jurisdiction of America. They have kept their USA operations going in a seemingly normal way, so people in the US, America, haven't realized that these companies are officially situated elsewhere, despite the incredible amplification of those great corporations' annual profits, whose annual totals payable uh, to these corporation stockholders are of the same magnitude as the annual increase in the USA's joint internal and external debt increases. America is utterly bankrupt externally in terms of balance of trade due to its own oil companies now operating as Arab Arabian businesses. The national debt at the time of the New Deal was $33 billion, wow. which was the cost of World War I. Before World War I, we frequently had no national debt, whatever, uh, debt I guess, whatsoever is meant, whatever. Um, we had today a national debt that exceeds 800 billion. 30% of the indebted indebtedness came from underlying uh, from underlying of ever longer term mortgages. In 1934, the USA underwrote a completely obsolete building industry, while Eisenhower allowed the banking world to make an incredible amount of money in interest rates and services in support of the building and real estate gain, which building in which building industry, if it were any good, would pay the USA back handsomely. The USA cannot even pay the annual interest on its 800 billion national debt. That is why Nixon's Nixon presidency and all those since have had to enter each year with a negative budget, acknowledging that at year's end, the USA will be a hundred billion uh, magnitude uncoverable deeper in debt. Our foreign trade balance indebtedness is, as of September 1979, $104 billion. Yeah, I'm putting dollars in there. Uh, 86 billion if foreign branches uh, of the U of U.S. banks are taken into account. Some totally, what has been taken from the people of the USA runs into many trillions of dollars. In a quarter of a century since Eisenhower, America has become completely bankrupt, which is which with its world leader leadership. Its financial credit and its reputation for courage, vision, and human leadership gone. None of this was none of this was America, the American people's doing. It was all done in an absolutely legal but utterly invisible manner by the lawyer capitalism. Wow. Invisible bankers, industrial corporation officers at all have had to do what their lawyers told them to do. No bad people have been involved. The lawyers were following their survival instinct and doing so completely legally. Everything we have reported here has been published at one time or another, but with the individual items so often so far apart from the last relevant item that the public has tended to not to remember and associate the items. As a consequence, the total, the total picture presented here is approximately unknown to any but the Wall Street lawyers, grand strategists, most of whom are no longer alive. By the way, one of my uh, earliest. Go ahead. Go ahead. Any, let's let's pause for three dot the three stars here. Is there any comments or questions so far? 
except the U.S. debt. Is I don't now think Bucky likes lawyers. Yeah. The U.S. debt is now $4 trillion, not $100 billion. Good grief. So... Um. Um, I think the scary thing is that it says here that there is no bad people involved. You know, it's like, uh, there, this, this is actually um, funds that have gone out of the country and there are no bad people involved. Wow. Hmm. Yeah. I think he, the way I read that is that he's saying that they did it legally. Correct. Um, in the sense that they're not they're, that they're not bad in that regard, um, I don't necessarily agree to think that they're that all this uh, uh, just happened above board. I'm sorry, I, I don't. Yeah, like, no, I, meaning, I, think, I, I think he's skipping a lot. No, I think I think that was tongue in cheek, yeah. as saying there's no bad no. people and the fact that it's all done legally. You know. Um, he just didn't put the inverted commas there, and I think that in itself is is horrifying at its uh, highest level because these people are no longer alive. Yeah, so there's nobody to hold accountable. You know. Yeah. Hmm. The, the atomic energy uh, in America is is I was on a for four or five years about five years ago. Uh, they were trying to create a energy waste dump out here west of Salt Lake City, and they downgraded the uh, atomic waste down to something more than fertilizer. They were going to bring in a big trains across the United States and then put it on trucks and bring it and put it over on a go shoot Indian reservation over here behind uh, a chain link fence. And each of these big containers were going to be big cement um, uh, tanks. That if if somebody dropped a bomb or threw a stick of dynamite at it, it would explode and and it would poison the air and poison Salt Lake City just like that. And the state kept making changes in their laws to accommodate that nuclear waste dump over here until finally a few people got uh, angry and. Uh, convinced the governor, and they put an end to it. Uh, but it's just amazing how these lawyers uh, try to manipulate uh, things in order to fulfill their capitalistic needs. Any other comments or questions? Okay. Joe, we can continue re you reading as long as you're comfortable. If you want to pass it off, just invite somebody else. Or well, maybe next time around, I'll give it one more shot. Cool. I just wanted to make see if I uh, if I can pick it up a little bit. I don't know. One you of my know, earliest books. I would I would read that? faster. I wouldn't read any faster because I'm I'm traveling along with you at a perfect space. Go ahead. Mm. Okay, thank you. Uh, one of my earliest books was Nine Chains to the Moon, written in 1935 and published by Lippincott in July 1938 and now being published by Doubleday. In it, I referred so frequently to finance capitalism that I developed a contraction of, of those two words into FinCap. FinCap had died in a lingering death between 1929 and 1934. In this book, Critical Path, I refer so often to the lawyer res uh, re resurrected capitalism that it is an approx it, it is approxi approximate Appropriate. Uh, appro oh, sorry. Okay. Appropriate. Uh, to refer to henceforth to uh, law cap. Law caps capitalism is paradoxically the most highly socialized organization all in all history. The citizens of law cap welfare state, the whole body of corporate stockholders, Having an annual average toll of a hundred thousand per capita, were there, were there even having to make a pretense of getting a job? If we take the billions of dollars given in, in the nineteen thirties to the 
to the great U.S. defense industry corporations by the New Deal Reconstruction Finance Corporation. If we had taken the hidden tax deduction subsidies to do research, development, and advertising given to all these companies in pre-1942 dollars between 1933 and 1980, if we take the, the 100 billion in foreign aid that paid for the overseas establishment of the great corporations, if we take the 155 billion of atomic know-how and development taken over by oil com by the oil companies, and if we take the number of fine uh, uh, fine ounces of gold bullion taken uh, taken out of the world out of America's exclusive wait, wait, wait fine ounces of gold bullion taken out of America's exclusively by cap the capitalist world banking system world's banking system. And if we take a reasonably low estimate of the unknown billions of dollars taken out of the USA by the CIA to operate exclusive capitalism without knowledge or authority of the people of the USA, US of America quasi-democracy, and if we multiply the sum of the four foregoing figures by 25, which is the amount to which our present USA dollars have been depreciated between the time of the appropriations and January 1, 1980, we come to a figure in the magnitude of $6 trillion that, is, that has been legally transferred from the USA People's National Capital Account over the, over the capital ownership account of the stockholders of the hundred of the thousand largest transnational exclusively American flag flying corporations. Okay, let's let's pause right there. This chart that's stuck in the middle of the page here actually uh, is appears on page one fifteen of the book, as you see noted by the uh, in this little thing right here. Um, and but here's the chart over to the side and he's actually mapping this debt and this loss of resource in that little chart over there between 1920 and uh up to 1965 and it shows us some um compounding chart that goes off the wall right uh it's crazy but i i find this you know although i see what becky is saying which is true in terms of conclusion. There is a direct correlation between energy, between output and energy consumed, right? So, so the real wealth is not zero. It is not. And by far it's not so. Now, what appeared to be zero is the application of a know-how. I don't know why it appears to be zero is, or why it says it is zero is that in the application of a know-how, people twisted things. And we know that today, and even this curve, by the debt of the, of the US and the amount of money that is in circulation in the world. We know that the U.S. debt, in relationship to the no, no, we know that the U.S. debt is is a hundred and something trillions. It is not ten trillion. If you take into account all the unfunded liabilities and things like that, that is the order of magnitude. We also know that. Uh, if you just excluded the uh, unfunded liability, the U.S. debt, I think if I not, if I say clear, is equal 100% or so of the U.S. GDP, isn't it? U.S. GDP is in the order of uh, $25 trillion. And what is the U.S. debt, the debt that is accounted, excluded the uh, unfunded liability, uh, See, is that what you are showing here? Yeah, the U.S. debt is thirty-two trillion. 30 okay, yeah, that's it. So, so, and the U.S. GDP is how much? Uh, 
It's also about 30, right? I don't know. I'm going to put that together right 24. Now. 24. 24 trillion? Yeah. And that doesn't account for unfunded liabilities. Oh, no, it's 36. Or no, China's 24 then. Yeah. And that China doesn't that account time. for the net situation of all um, futures and option contracts in the world. If you were to settle everything today, what would be the next situation? What would be the payout? And who will have to pay out? I hmm. suspect the US will have to pay out a lot. Yeah, they would. Yes. So that curve, that's why I was insisting, is it looks very much as something that we had today. It looked very, very similar to the money supply all over the world. Joe, you can help here. Um, if you take this curve, you, if you take this curve and you put it in a log, in a log, um, scale. It will fit very much so the for the time that we have here, the debt, the the the, the money supply. I'm not. Under, I don't think I understood what you said. I'm saying. If you look at this curve that we have on page 115. That curve right there. Yep. And that is from 1920 to basically 1971, about. And you remember what 1971 is, is that the US economy and the world economy basically for that, Goal has been taken away. It was pegged to a certain thing, but it was been it's been kind of restricted, and it was free. You know, like uh, the U.S. dollar in 1971 was completely depegged from gold, right? By Nixon, and it was depegged from yes. gold by Nixon because of this curve. The liabilities of the U.S. were vertical like this. And the U.S. could not, if the claim came at one point, the U.S. would be bankrupt. The U.S. would not be able to settle. Does it make sense in the first point? Mm. Yes. Okay. So if the U.S. is not able to settle in 1971 and Nixon closes, President Nixon closes the gold window, everything after that becomes monetary, right? Because the real economy, you have put it in a cage. And you can be moving in a suitcase all over the world if you want. And the game becomes a monetary game. And then you repeat the same thing. Because if you take the basis, instead of 1925, you take it from 1971, and you look at the money supply, you have exactly the same curve. You have initially a flat curve with a lot of volatilities till like the 80s, and then it does the same elbow exponential. And the consequence of that is that we're trying to play a linear game with things that are, ex that are really exponential. The fundamental of it is that the real life that in economics we're trying to kind of stylize and get some accounting of it is exponential. Mm. And yet we are trying to get an arithmetic 
a linear accounting of it. It doesn't work. It will not exp and and then we do that because we we kind of cheat all the time. We're changing the basis of calculation to give an illusion. And that's where things today as inflation, that is to most people, it is something, inflation is not real. It's always a monetary effect, but it is the effect of it that real. Cool. Are you complete? Mm -hmm. Yes. Cool. Joe, do you remember where we are? Um, I think one paragraph before. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for that, Manu. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It actually gives us perspective. Um, yeah, okay. Yeah, it was the 1,000 largest transnational, exclusively American flag flying corporation. The transnationally operating law cap in the night early 19 or early 50s resurrected the 20 year debt in cap and its capitalist world and left oh, only its american flag flying storefronts in the usa to cover its comprehensive financial withdrawal from the usa law cap silently and invisibly moved capitalism's big time operations into the any legally uh uh, uh, propor propri uh, proprietous elsewhere. Propitious. 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 Forgive me, guys. That's two times. Um, with its invisibly uh, operating CIA, capitalism invisible army, law cap exploited the unwitting citizens of the USA in order, they hoped, to destroy socialism. In 1947 to 50, law cap decision to start a World War III to, had two objectives. One, to keep capitalism in business, and two, to prevent the Russians from the, employing their industrial productivity to produce a higher standard of living for their own people than, than that demonstrated in the USA. Law Cap's decision to start World War III inaugurated history's greatest game of poker, with the USSR as the, a very reluctant player, worried about its home folks, po political agitation for a few goodies. It became a poker game that called for each side adding approximately $100 billion per year into the Killing Grease Kitty. They had now, they had now done so for thir for thirty years. This amounts to six trillion. By complete coincidence, six trillion happens to, happens to be approximately the same magnitude as that of the total mileage per year traveled by light operating and uh, light operating one hundred eighty six thousand miles each second of the year. Throughout those thirty years. What's that? I said, "Geez, that's an interesting correlation between the speed of light." I, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't. Yeah, I, that was kind of lost on me. Yeah. Well, to be quite honest, just to, the speed just to of come light per that. second. Huh. The speed of light per second is six trillion miles per year. I suppose one hundred eighty-six thousand miles per second is a hundred is six trillion miles per year. That's the correlation he's trying to draw. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of a the value of that is so three hundred and sixty five times yeah you well three hundred and sixty five times Am I missing? six trillion. That's all. He's just drawing a metaphorical correlation between uh the six trillion dollars and the speed of light in a year. That's all he's trying to do. All I right. I think it's kind of clever, but that's, he's just being cute. It, it is clever. Yeah. That's clever. Yeah, it teaches on. Uh, throughout those 30 years, the USA, ha ha USA half of this 6 trillion, that is 3 trillion, was redeposited at various turnover rates per year in the Western world's banks. And the latter continually 
loan those dollars at historically unprecedentedly high rates to armaments industry. The net of it all was to convert science and technology's highest capability into accomplishing the killing of ever more people at ever greater distances in ever shorter time. Lawcap's comprehensive grand strategy had its Achilles heel. Okay, having successfully I'd left like to, I'd like to pause there just for a second because he says something interesting here that because it looks like the war, as soon as the war in Ukraine started, what did the banks do? They raised their interest rates. Yeah. So here's this interesting correlation. Uh, again, historically unprecedented high rates of interest to armament to the armament industry. That's exactly what's going on today. And I, I, for the life of me, I do not get the correlation about the Fed raising its interest rates to um, how that stops inflation. Uh, uh, it just, it boggles my mind about that correlation. I've just never been able to figure it out. It stops, it stops employers from hiring people, but it does put a tax on the, uh, on the military industrial complex. So that's just a really curious thing for me. So I just thought I would just comment about that. Thanks. Let I'm, me put on this comment. You know, I respect Becky very much, but I, I think that is skipping something very important. It is legally organized tech. And real mm -hmm. wealth is not yes. zero. Let us put it clear. It is an organization moving the world to control resources of the world. Right. And subject people of the world. In the US, it does it via inflation. Elsewhere, it does it via interest rate. And the real issue is always appropriation of the rare resources that underpin any development. You need know how and some resources to put it together to produce something, whatever, even the clean energy, so-called clean energies. So, the war in Ukraine, why the war in Ukraine, why? It just happened? It has to do with a control. So what Becky is calling here socialism, actually geographically, it espouses again that area, which was then called Soviet Union is about the control of, never forget that, Ukraine and Russia, in terms of cereal production, account to, I don't know how much, but a lot in the supply of the world. Never forget that, in that area, there are rare earths. There are things that support the industry there, there and there, right? So the whole of this thing, the way Bucky presented it, is like it has an hypothesis that the know-how nullifies the value of a real, what you call real. Well, that's not true. That was my point there. Oh. Because if you look at, you know, who do you lend to? In the US, it's taking what let's just say, see that mechanism. You you arrive internationally. Who what do you call foreign aid? It comes and it keeps people in bondage in terms of their pay interest mm -hmm. and they utterly bankrupt their economies. It's always been like that. The so-called third world economy fail, not because of their wanting. You have a management of an economy that is utterly corrupt. And then you have the suffering of, of, of the value that is paid to these banks annually. And it's been calculated clear that when you look at $100 in foreign debt, what you call foreign debt, foreign direct investment, it goes through the window by $150. How can it be done 50 years in a row? And you'll be surprised that, you know, the income of people is not rising, it's decreasing. Mm. It is true. Right, that's true. I 
I'm through with my venting. Okay. Yeah. It's a good point. Yeah, and he's about to mention World War Three here, and that's we're still doing this. Yes. Right. USSR. We're playing these games with the USSR. And I just hate to get political on this phone call, but the Ukrainian yeah. war, they had an agreement twice to not have a war. And the US and Britain stepped in and told uh, the Ukrainian government that they could not sign a peace agreement. And this is the second time. Yeah. It's March, great. I was. I, yeah. Uh, okay. Anyway. Continue. Having successfully lifted six trillion from the Nile 20th century's world's leading nation, the USA and its pe and its people, Lawcap, puppeted the USA's people into expending another of it of their own six trillion in in playing the drop dead killingly poker game with the USSR, exclusively on behalf of in, of invisible Lawcap. The latter was sure that with its complete control of all the world's money to back the USA, the latter will, could not lose the kill and great poker game with the USSR. Counting on winning the poker game, Lawcap started planning its own post-World War III future. Lawcap, once more, deceived its so easy to dece deceive USA puppet with the, the uh, Kibitzing of the of the USA's playing of its killing group poker hand, Lockhart did so uh, through its enormous media control and its election funding and lobbying lobbying power of the American political game. Lockhart had its own had its political leaders convinced the USA people that they were playing the poker game so satisfactorily that the USA assumed that it was far ahead in atomic bombs, which gave it complete national security and, and assumedly maintained its world around power and prestige. Lawcap was confident that with ownership of all money and control of all the Western world's arms producing facilities, they could outlast the USSR's ability to cope with its internal pressure for shifting its productivity toward its people's lifestyle. As serpenticity um, agitated for by, for by the CIA's psycho guerrilla operation, Serpentitious. Sorry. Should have said. Psycho guerrilla operations. Period. Because it was a poker game, the Russians realizing the intercontinentally de delivered warheads with a 20 minute lag between rocket blast off and landing bang off inadvertently provided a 20-minute radar lead. That meant for the first shooting at them 20 minutes before the bullets would reach them, which gave the both sides 20, 20 minutes within which to get away all of, all of both sides, atomic bombs, gases, germs, and death rays before the Big Bang, thus for producing the first war in history in which both sides and all their allies would lose. To be a survivor of such a war would be worse than, than being killed by it. Planet Earth would be humanely untenable. Because the Russians knew all this was so, and the American people did not seem to know it was so, the Russians assumed after the uh, Khrushchev Eisenhower Geneva meeting in 1955, the atomic bomb warfare would never occur. That is the way the USSR played their poker hand. They assumed only enough atomic bomb making to camouflage their strategy, while they counted on conventional arms, vast divisions of armed and trained men, and the greatest ever of world history line of world supply controlling uh, uh, needs. Uh, the latter featured all of their, their now pre 
uh, perfected virt uh, virtual uh, planes being above the sea surface emitted vertically ascending in the sky from enormous bellied atomic submarines moving far more swiftly submerged 70 knots that then could be the surface battling 40 to 50 knot aircraft carriers this the ussr assessed to be the world winning strategy the reason the law that law cap strategized uh, kibitzed its usa's Play, players into folding four atomic bomb aces and an aircraft carrier king was because Lawcap wanted to be sure uh, the atomic energy and technology was so advanced and proliferated by World War III's end that they could employ its USA's people's paid for basic equipment and widely developed uranium mines and production sources and its scientific personnel to produce the energy to run through their money-making matters after their fossil fuels were exhausted. Lawcap's cu uh, cupidity outwitted its wisdom Lowcap sense of evolutionary event acceleration was faulty. They bluffed only the people of the USA, not the Russians. The Russians have not have now attained so commanding a leading a lead in the killing re poker game that even the USA president concedes that it would take the USA a minimum of ten years to restrategy itself. Uh, so that it could in any way cope with the Russians' conventional naval supremacy and its vastly greater numbers of modernly armed divisions of world or around war fighting capabilities. In the meantime, as already mentioned, the US, United States has gone completely bankrupt internally. Its national indebtedness coming very closely to a trillion dollars. Uh, and its balance of trade debt to 109 billion, worsening at a horrendous rate due to law caps arranging to force a, the USA to obtain almost half of its half its petroleum energy from the Near East. The USA has for eight years been past for eight years past been able unable to meet even the interest on its internal debt and demonstrated by a negative balance of trade. Its future credit has been uh, hypothecated. Uh, uh, hypothecated. Hypothecated. That just Hypopo means... Uh, hy hy oh, hypothesized. Right? Hypothecated. Hypothecation is a, is a way of, it's a form of borrowing, hypothecation. It's been loan. It's been used as collateral for loans. That's what hypothecation means. So if you hypothecate your house, you're getting a mortgage on your house. That's actually the real. That's actually the real word. See, it's what? That's actually the real word. Hypothecate. Yeah, hypothecate. Yes, that is that is the original word. Yeah. For collateral. Yeah, for collateral. <laughs> yes, collateral is modern. Yeah. So there you go. Credit has been hypothecated 30 years beyond Armageddon. <laughs> I feel pretty ignorant not knowing that. <laughs> um, it's bad. Uh, okay. Um, uh, okay. So, what did I say? Is, nothing um, to, nothing I, to stop. That's where you had your. Uh, I'm trying to give. Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah, I, I see it. Here. It's like I. It's hypothecated thirty years beyond Armageddon. Yeah. Nothing to stop the U.S. U.S. Treasury from issuing twenty fifty notes. But for how far into the future can ball cap keep selling USA promissory notes? Unless God has something else in mind, it looks as though it will not be for long. Be long before. Law caps kibitzing 
of the USA will ha have lost the six trillion Kellingry poker game. Russia will, will not hesitate to call the USA hand and rank in the winnings of Omni World line of supply control, maritime, aeronautical, and astronautical. Can we uh, can we comment in one way? Stop the comment. Sure. Okay. Now, Critical Path is published in 1979, right? Yeah, 1986, right? No, no, no. Before he died. Okay. Okay. Bucky died in 1983. So Critical Path is right around 1980. So, but in, the, in 1980, he writes this. What happened there? Which system collapsed? Because his pronostic is that U.S. SR will wreck the poker game, isn't it? Right. By 1990. It's right. written there. But USSR collapsed. Yeah, everybody missed that. Yeah. And I think that, you know, Becky really identified who was in control but he didn't grasp really how powerful they were. Right. To keep on playing the game. As we stand today, the 250 promissory notes are already been issued. That's what you call the 30-year the, the bond of US government. We have, Angel, we, do we have 30-year 30, 30 bond today? Yeah. Yeah, 30 year bond is 2050 maturity. We're in yeah. 2020. And the system is continuing. Money is still being supplied. For how long can it be inflated? That was the real issue. I think the USA and USSR were just kibitzers. Hey, Steve? We're just what? Kibitzers. Kibitzers. Oh, kibitzers, yeah. They are just, they are just, we just in the world offering commentary, you know, on one of that commentaries because they want us to talk while the real thing is being done. Because if the money is not in the US and it's not in the third world, where is it going to? Hmm. If it's not in the Western world, it's not the Eastern world, it's not in the third world, where is it going to? Why is the world unbalanced? If you take the, the accounting at the planetary level, it has to be somewhere, right? You have to have assets and liabilities. And it has to balance. So the owner equity, Joe, where is he going to? To balance the book. <laughs> where is he going to? Yeah. The American people are complaining that they are getting poorer and poorer, right? Right. What's people going to? Oh. Like us, we are complaining that we're getting poorer and poorer. Manu. People in Asia. And all these uh, imagined economies that say they're getting poorer and poorer. Where is it going to? Um, Manu, yeah. you just pointed out two really, really mind-blowing uh, points here, yeah? Um, and uh, one is that, uh, you know, yeah, why didn't USA collapse? Why well, it was USSR that collapsed? And you're right. Both sides were, were not thinking. Uh, they were more interested in, in, in you know, um, benefiting the individuals right right and um, the second one is that yeah where is the money it's not in the east it's not in the west where is it so i just want to point out thank you that 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 is you just point out two 
really, really powerful uh, things here that uh, bears examining. Okay. Now that, that's what I have to say. Yeah. Okay. It's um, I'm trying. Bucky was the first conspiracy theorist. <laughs> I don't know. Okay, what were you going to say, Joe? No, I'm um, looking up, uh, and I should know this is uh, uh, at the defense budget as a proportion of GDP. Um, for the USA at this current time, because for the Soviet Union, all right, well, it's still a lot lower. Okay, um, for the Soviet Union, it was extraordinarily high. It was seventeen percent. It was just that's a, it wasn't accounted for, Joe. You understand what I'm trying to say? That, we yeah. are. We don't know that in reality. We that's don't. My know. Point. We have no idea. We are keep it. No, it's true. We pretend to know. We don't know. Because we're not educated, and that's why it is important. Uh, it goes beyond it. It's they're not transparent. Yeah, but we know it's a game. If I'm profiting from something, why should I be transparent? In the yeah, in the yeah. evolution type one evolution, why should I be transparent? So, so to do the right thing is, for example, if I take, you know, a third world country where leaders of a country are in control of things. Now, when you are signing, at least signing the agreements for say a mine or something that a resource that you are, what do you have in mind? Do you have your mm. petty interest or do you see it as a lever to uplift as many people around you as possible. Unfortunately, most of the time is the first one. And right. if, if the populace starts kind of uh, asking too much, they use the military to put them in place. That's all. Right. Look at Myanmar. Look at many places in Africa. Look at Latin America. It's always the same gameplay. So it takes the conscience, and I don't know where we discuss conscience, the conscience of the leadership, those who are in power, to really want to play the game. Otherwise, you have two fronts. You have the internal front between you as an individual and the government. And then between you and actual fact, society in general, because they take you for a lunatic, they take you for somebody who doesn't know what he wants. So, okay, so it's you and the government. And the second uh, grouping was, I'm sorry. And the second grouping was what, Joe? That's what I'm asking you now. It was you and, and your public and, and, and society. The public, society yeah, that's okay, society. yeah. Society is you. Thank you. Like, like I, I read, I read the, the latest posting of Ray Dalio, right? Mm -hmm. Where Ray Dalio, his assessment is actually that China is operating, can operate a very beautiful delivery. As he was talking about what China is doing today. So, but what we're seeing is that, oh, China is in problem. Their GDP is not growing as, who say that as, it just has to be growth. And then there was this one guy that is kind of influence, uh, influential, influential. And he just wrote that he's lost every respect, any respect for Ray Dalio. 
But if you have been listening to Ray Dalio, what is happening in the world today? I'm talking about economically in the world. He described it five years ago. Or since right. Joe, am I right? You're right. You know, read Absolutely. it. It will be fascinating. And he's only using history and his practice of in the world of finance and economics to make those predictions. Only that is not Einstein. The biggest pre pretension of mankind is to think that the small knowledge that you have is bigger than the unknown. It is not. That's why you should be always be ready to put it to test and change if necessary. Not change to, to preserve your positions against every principle, but change to adapt your positions to the principles. And it cannot do be done without friction. There's a price to pay for it. I'm true. Okay, cool. You want to continue, Joe? Uh, sure. I mean, uh, uh, the U.S. is not run. Uh, yeah, is it, the U.S. is not run by its would be. Steven, did you make that smaller by any chance, or is that my? my I didn't make it smaller. I can make. Oh, no, it. you know what I did. I no no no. I I never mind. I popped out the. I see what I did. I popped up the. Uh, there we go. Okay. Yeah. Well, now I've lost my. Uh, 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 so there. Are, so I'm good. You gotta go back. Here we go. The U.S. is not run. Here we go. The U.S. is not run by its would-be democratic government. All the latter can do is tr is try to adjust to the initiatives already taken by low caps great corporations. Nothing could be more pathetic than the role that has to be played by the president of the United States, whose power is approximately zero. Nevertheless, the news media and most over 30 years of age USA citizens carry on as if the president had pa supreme power. All that he had and the Congress can do is adjust is to adjust to to what free what the free enterprise system has already done. They are riding on the snapping end of the power structure drag stru structure dragon tail. You know, I, I really quickly I just you know was making a comment this week about this very thing is that. Uh, you know, yes, the president does hold a lot of influence, and as does the Congress. But it is interesting to see how things like uh, the military-industrial complex and certain foreign policy initiatives don't seem to change. That's all I noticed. Anyway, well, if what, I had not been studying, what, what boggles my mind is that the American people. If our economy is going well, they they blame it on the president, and they give and they attribute right. that to the president. If the economy sucks, they say the president did a bad job. It's the most myopic thing. It's not even a it's reasonable insane. observation. The president is literally on the tail of the wagging dragon. Yeah, and absolutely. And Congress both. I mean, it is crazy. And I'll tell you this: there, I. I have hope for America in this a campaign thing because Robert Kennedy's coming out. Uh, we got some new Republican candidates coming out. And uh, although Robert Kennedy is the only guy I know of that's actually looking at the corporations, which are the problem, and the CIA. You know, although Vivek uh, Wamaswamy, Ramaswamy, he wants to get rid of the uh, FBI, he wants to collapse the FBI. Um, so and he's a Republican, probably right now the most attention-getting Republican candidate. So we're in America. We're going to see some amazing. Well, hopefully, we're going to see some amazing conversations that may just blow up into giant 
polarized conspiracy arguments, but there's hope maybe that we'll see some light at the end of this tunnel and actually identify the problems. The problems are the corporations. That's the problem. And they're doing everything behind the scenes until they don't, until we bring it out and expose it. Thank you for letting me rant. I'm complete. Want to continue? If I had not been studying, yeah, sure. If I had not been studying and working for half a century on the, the assumption that this present state of affairs would come about at about this moment in history, I would have to be very pessimistic now about the human affairs of the 7% of the world's population situated within the national boundaries of the United USA, let alone critically threatened omni humanity. But in fact, I have been studying and working anticipatorily throughout all those intervening uh, 53 years. And I now, I now, I know what I am talking about. The world now has an, uh, has an option to become comprehensively, sustainingly successful for all. And that is what this book is all is about how to do so, and do so expeditiously even enough to succeed within the time limit. How to do so is implicit in the chapters that follow, starting with the manner in which I came to discover the critical options and the individual self-disciplines that came naturally to disclose the grand strategy of human survival and successful functioning. Only cosmic costing accounts when cosmic costing accounts for the entirely interdependent electrochemical and ecological relationships of Earth's biological evolution and cosmic intertransformative regeneration in, is, in general. Cosmic costing accounts as well as, as well for the parts played gravitationally and radiationally in the totality within which our minuscule planet Earth and its minuscule star, the Sun, are interfunctionally secreted. Cosmic costing makes utterly ludicrous the selfish and fearfully contrived wealth gains being reverently played by humanity aboard Earth, reverently. Fortunately, the sun does not demand a payment for all the energy that it delivers by radiation to Earth in the overall cosmic scheme, which is trying to make humanity a success despite our overwhelming ignorance and fear. The stars are trying to tell humanity to awake and prosper and to consciously assume the important cosmic responsibilities for which it is, was designed. <clears throat> Since realization and fulfillment of that responsibility involved evolutionary discovery by humanity of the cosmic stature of its mind and the inconsequentially inconsequentiality of its of its muscle, the planting of humans on Earth may not bear fruit. When universe is developing important functional interdependency, she does not put all her embryos in the same proverbial basket or fiscus. So poor is the probability of self-discovery by humans of the infinite potential of the mind and the relative triviality of human muscle power, which is not even as capable as a grasshopper's. Great nature must be must have be must have planted a myriad of human function equivalent seedlings on the myriad of planets. In order to succeed as local and universe critical information gatherers and local and universe problem solvers in support of the integrity of eternally regenerative scenario universe, the human function equip equipment for the for local in universe information gathering will be as variable as the varied environments in the in universe rarely will they have the the appearance of hum, human organisms such would be employed only under environmental conditions similar to those of planet earth 
similar to the those, yeah, those of planet Earth. The first manifestation that humanity make good on its uh, on this planet will be the serious introduction of cosmic costing into the mainstream deliberations of Earthians. Cosmic accounting completely eliminates the economic validity of bankruptcy accounting, except when humans make the mistake of trying to hoard or withdraw capital, critical capital assets from production functioning. Withdrawal of capital assets is akin to attempting to withdraw one of the stars from the celestial system into what the universe into what universe other than the cosmic totality may the star be transferred every atom and electron in an essential part of the eternally regenerative ergo totally inexhaustible but always locally ebbing and fl flooding pulsed um pulsative universe Cool. That's the end of the section. That puts us at the end of page 120. Page 121 is a uh, section page, and then uh, 22 is blank, and then page 123 actually starts the next section. And um, we're about one third of the way through the book on the basis that the actual text of this book is 346 pages long, and we're at one pa at page 120. Acknowledging the fact that on page 347 begins a chronology, a chronology of scientific discoveries and artifacts. So evidently, um, with all the dates that we got about the development of technology and the development of culture and different steam, you know, different energy development, those are all in a chronology at the uh, in a section of the book that begins on page 347. So a lot of the facts that he's thrown out are just listed there as dates, and then he put them in the uh, thing. There's other uh, things here about uh, a chron chronological inventory of prominent scientific, technological, and economic, and political world events from uh, 1895. So he goes through, uh, and then there's a table of contents uh, at the end, I mean, a, a, a an index at the end of the book. So there's a lot of good resources back here at the end of this thing, but we're one uh, one quarter, one third through the book, and I kind of looked ahead, and he's going to tell us about um, section part uh, chapter four is self disciplines of Buckminster Fuller. We'll start that next week. Uh, we could start it tonight, I suppose. Um, we have a few minutes. He's going to outline. Uh, Probably, nah, I think we I think we ought to start it next week so we can get the whole thing in a flow. How do you Good. feel about that, everybody? Yes, yes. I wonder I'm going to page two to to part two. I think yeah. we've reached a level where we can now really have a substantial comment on what he said. Sure. Because he's ending this part with that we have an option. The question is, what is the cost of that option to an individual? Mm. And the cost of it is education, is to be self-disciplined, to have self-discipline and to understand the general principles and practice them. It is not easy. Yeah. And that, that, that section, those things, because that part two actual part is a summary in a less scientific language of all it says in synergetics, in a, what is the name of the other book that we study? Um, Grunge? No, not Grunge. The other one. The one that we studied before Grunge. Uh, Utopia or Oblivion? Yes. See, you see, in, yeah. in, the, in, the, in, in, the, in the face of this overwhelming power of law cap, we have an option. It's like Goliath and David. David had a sling. And Goliath didn't know what the sling was. Goliath was used on these heavy things, the muscle, but it wasn't used to the cunning. And that cunning came with 
the appropriation that David knew about what you call circular momentum and timing to release for it to be coming linear momentum, right? Hello, I want feedback. Because <laughs> that what was it? It was the application of a, of a law, of general principles. Mm. That you take a sling and you put a stone, you first accelerate, right? Circular acceleration. And then you release it into linear motion to a target. That was the forehead of Goliath. To maximum effect. Right. Well, I've been reading, kind of snooping ahead, and he's actually going to talk about precession and how it affects this whole thing. So he's going to be uh, the reason why he goes into his, the self disciplines of Buckminster Fuller is he wants to establish himself as a credible witness for how there are. He, he just ended up here with cosmic accounting and. Yes. And he's going to bring in this whole idea of cause. But so I'm really looking forward to that because I have, I have some major stories in my life about uh, capitalism, and uh, and uh, and free enterprise and how it's how. And I'm going to put free enterprise in quotes because, um, you know, because we have a system and and like and much of our system is is based on the fact that there are giant corporations who are really running everything. And then uh, we Americans get to run around on the fringes and participate in some way and not, not even seeing the whole problem in the first place. And um, this movie I saw in uh, the called Landscape of Invisible with Invisible Hand, whoa, it's, uh, it's an amazing commentary on this whole thing. And we're moving into a major crisis with artificial intelligence. And, um, and I, you know, I'm not, and it's not just because you're here, the very idea that you're teaching kids in school to find their passion and to build a business, to build some kind of community response uh, to their passion, which may not look like a business right now, but just getting involved if they like sports, but they're not athletic, then become a reporter or become a podcaster or do something, you know, find your passion. And, and you don't have to fit in the box with everybody else. I mean, if if that lesson could go out to everyone, that would be a, I think it's gonna, it'll go, that lesson will go out to everyone, even if it's the face of a major collapse, even if it's in the, and, and, you're, and you're doing ahead of the collapse. So your kids are all ahead of the game and I'm very excited for you. So, um, and I'm excited about this year's uh, political campaign in America because there are a couple of candidates who are not who are not afraid to to talk about the corporations and the the way that the CIA is meddling in all of international and local and USA intranational reporting, influencing things. The CIA, the FBI, it's ridiculous. And these 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 government agencies have become basically messengers for and pawns for giant corporations um so i don't know i hope that at the end i get I, uh, I get some good principles so we're kind of wrapping it up um I, you know what joe what were you going to say no i mean I, I actually i could save it to wrap up okay how do you feel joe and I, what's your takeaway uh -huh. <laughs> no what do you want to um, do no, I mean, I, if I'm thinking about this, I'm just, you know, thinking about what we've read to date. Um, and and Bucky does seem to be um, uh, obviously very critical of the financial system, for which I think he had a lot of, um, uh, you know, reason to be. And as we still do have reason to be uh, for reasons that we've spoken um and how finance is basically financing itself is a big problem especially in the united states um i i do think that there uh i think that the final section that we talked about 
specifically with cosmic accounting uh, is probably one of the most important things to think about going forward um, and thinking about things beyond uh, just the financial aspect, the transactional aspect of things and financial accounting and actually taking into uh, account, no pun intended, taking into account um, uh, things outside of money. Um, and uh, which means that uh, is the ecosystem uh, and well-being of individuals uh, overall. And I think that there are people that are trying to um, to uh, to create those measures that are beyond uh, GDP uh, and that are beyond some of the traditional financial calculations. Uh, and I think that that's, that's a step in the right direction. I'm not saying it's been perfected yet by any stretch of the imagination, but I think we're getting closer to what Bucky would call cosmic accounting. What is, what is it really costing us? Uh, and then and the ethics aspect of it. Um, well, there are some ethics uh, that, that that still need to be called out. Um, but uh, so from that perspective, I think that the, you know I think that it's really encouraging. Uh, I don't think it's as lost as, as as we we may think. I do think that there is a lot of negative forces in the world, in particular at this point in time. Um, you know, obviously with a war going on, that's pretty negative. And I think there's a lot of tension and, and a lot of um, protectionist kind of policies that are actually not looking to cooperate with other countries. Uh, and and I think that that can be, end up to be especially harmful in the long run. Um, so, uh, and one last point, I do think that we can come to a point where, uh, as I'd said in the outset of this, um, Bucky's painted a very dark picture of what, of government's relationship with corporations, but there is a possible more public partnership public-private partnership that actually focuses away from killing gray, so to speak, and focuses more towards um, issues that address everybody's problems, uh, whether it you know, be the environment, whether it be people's um, ability to have a, a good education, whether it be people's ability to have enough to eat, um, whether it be, you know, uh, uh, the ability to have clean air. And I think that there are private public partnerships that actually can work in those in those circumstances. So I think what the invitation is here is to take what we've seen and how the system has been manipulated and kind of redirect that energy, as we've said, uh, towards things that actually, um, are beneficial to all of us, to everyone. Um, I think that we also need to think about, um, yeah, how we finance a lot of these, um, a lot of how we finance everything at this point. Uh, and, 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 uh, and, and yeah, it, and what we're financing, you know, I'm not totally, uh, I'm not a total pacifist, but at the same time, to spend more than the next 10 countries combined on defense is absolutely lunacy. Uh, so with that being said, I think that this sets us up for an interesting um, next two thirds of the book. Uh, so, you know, that's my, my takeaway. Uh, and um, I look forward to to really kind of brainstorming, you know, talking about what, where we've been, but also talking where, about where we possibly can go in the next two thirds of the book. 
so I think that that would be really, I, I, I appreciate everybody's insights here. So uh, in hearing that, I would, uh, that would be a really good, you know, interesting. Um, I was talking to somebody about smart cities earlier and how to repurpose things and how to, um, you know, there's a real estate crisis you know, kind of in a way and, and the world's changing uh, as the way, even the way people work and live. Uh, there is a shortage of housing, but there's a lot of buildings. It's not that simple, but um, there's a lot of solutions that can be had uh, in trying to figure out kind of um, take what, what has happened, know where we are and kind of envision where we can be. Anyway, so it's pretty cool to be here with you guys. And how are you doing? What do you? What would you like to take? Oh, uh, and how are you feeling? And what did you, what's, what did you take away from this evening? Um, thank you. I'm at at the moment. I'm 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 at the very thoughtful. I'm no thought, thoughtful won't be the right word. Um, introspective. Okay, kind of thinking about the things that we talked about um, today. And um, I, a couple of things I've noticed here. Yeah? Uh, one is that the, the whole idea of uh, Commonwealth, right? I really, really am, am uh, focusing on that. So the countries that are actually now, we talked just now the question about where the money is, right? I realized that the countries that are holding, they're not holding on. Uh, whatever money is spent, okay, they, they actually have, um, <clears throat> large amounts coming back and it, it is held within the country, right? And the people are living much, much better lives, right? Um, because they they are not letting the corporations uh, be the ones to, you know, bankrupt the, the country. A couple of countries, I, I think the Scandinavian countries are at that point. Um, I, I, I see that happening in um, in countries like Germany and Switzerland, I would say. Correct me if I'm wrong, yeah? Um, Singapore, for instance, um, the country itself is very, very wealthy. People-wise, yes, they're taken care of, but standard of living may look high, but uh, I think we have a better uh, uh, lifestyle in Malaysia than Singapore because we, we can own houses, we can own our own cars, mm. and... Um, in Singapore, they cannot, they live in like literally matchbox homes. So I'm, I know that there is that that um, contradiction right there. But uh, in countries like China, there's a lot of wealth in that country, um, et cetera, right? So that's number one. Number two, I also realized that uh, over the years, um, right now politically and at the top level of many, many um industries and corporations are, are still run by by people my generation right and th these are the ones making all the decisions that still uh, follow um, the law cap yeah um, however I'm also seeing another trend forming on the ground which would be the those in their 30s and uh, some in early 40s but a lot in their 30s right now because of the exposure that they've had, going um, to other countries to study and so on, the decisions they're making, uh, not just for their children, but even how they run their companies, how they deal with their families, they're different now. Even though they are um, third generation down the businesses, very, very wealthy, um, they're looking very much into um, uh, education, number one. Number two, um, there's this concern about their own staff you know, uh, rather than make them just making a lot of money. Um, and these are from wealthy, wealthy families in countries that are really known to just copy people's stuff, and just take it on um, uh, the lack of um, integrity and so on, right? I'm seeing that in the, the, uh, the third generation coming on board. Um, the, the whole focus on the environment um, and even for those from countries that are known to, you know, the, the tagline is why why create when you can copy? Okay, people from that country moving over to Canada, 
And in Canada, they're making decisions to have an education system where they can bring more people, more of the young people from China and Taiwan and, and the Korea and you know this part of the world over to Canada. And the main purpose is for the children to learn Canadian values. Okay, that when I was talking to um, this uh, a friend's brother who wanted to do this with a partner uh, from from um, I shall not know a name here because it's one of the largest economies in the world right now. That's what he wants to do to bring people from his own country over to Canada to learn the values. Yeah, um, and it's happening. I'm seeing that happening in the Southeast Asian region. Uh, from countries where really the ethics of running businesses and, and so on is really, really very poor. Um, yet the younger people are making very, very different decisions from their parents. And how I, I get to know all this is because uh, one of them said this, uh, people my generation, they were quite surprised um, that uh, people my generation were treating the younger folks well like going into partnership uh, in business, right? Generally, people my generation do not regard uh, those in their 30s uh, with respect that's according to the husband whose wife is collaborating with us, you know? So, so what I'm saying is that they're really looking at very, very different values. Um, and there's hope in that, yeah? Mm. So Manu, um, how do you feel and what is your takeaway? You know, <clears throat> very first, very appreciative and grateful for the sincere uh, contributions. Thank you for reading. That's all. It is an effort and we respect that. Uh, I thank you all, you know, and Joe for sharing, you know, what you you, you took from discussion today. To me, the biggest thing that I got was this word, uh, being a uh, kibitz. <laughs> well, it is that if you look at what is happening today, the public, the individual, and most people are kibitz. We in there making commentaries on things that we don't even understand. Take, for example, inflation. Everybody feels the effect of inflation today. But inflation is not real. We'll be made to believe that inflation is a natural effect. It's not. When I mean real, it's something natural. Inflation and money are ideas. Yeah. And Kiyosaki is big on this. They are only ideas. Yet, the application of those ideas have devastating effect. Nobody comes and steal the U.S.'s money from the, I mean, the U.S.'s people's money or wealth. It is stolen through inflation. No bank has ever come to you and say, Steve, that goal that you have, give them. No. But the condition that are created through debt, the average citizen of the world, of what you call the, the modern world, is indebted to the eyeballs, either by its own but, or by the government. They are indebted, whether you want it or not. And then the IMF and the World Bank, all these come in and say structural adjustment. Structural adjustment is just positioning whatever that you produce to repay the debt, which you didn't ask for, and which conditions you never negotiate. That's one of the aspects of the thing. But yet, in the face of that kind of, you know, unfavorable, you know, a game that you're engaging, there's an option. But that, that option will first have to come to realize it to be 
to be aware of it and to commit to really follow it. And it goes like education first. Education, education. To induce our natural potential, to draw from what we really are, to understanding what govern the structure, the environment in which we are. And Bucky chose consciously few words to transit from that to part two, cosmic accounting. You can't do cosmic accounting without first understanding what the general, general principles are, right? I take the example of, of solar energy as of today. Well, if you understand the reality, you understand that the solar is inextricably linked to the battery because you have to produce and store it, right? For use, because all the energy that the sun gives you, you cannot use it at the same time, just a little part that you have, us, and then you have to store it for use that is that makes your life easy and sustainable. Therefore, you have to talk about uh, battery, but battery requires lithium. Panel requires rare earths. And then very quickly, you have to understand the implication of, of appropriating those. Maybe they're not in your immediate environment. You have to cooperate. And you need to cooperate. It has to be on the fair terms. Fair means that you are looking at what you call uh, 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 um, uh, 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 Kelly will call empathic exchange. Mm -hmm. Take into account the widest possible interest for both to benefit. Because as of today, the solar energy has been to, to, to preserve the bloated, energy bloated developed economies. I mean, the energy that an individual, whether knowingly or unknowingly, consume in the US is insane. Mm. It is insane. And yet, it does not markedly improve the average life of uh, the American. I mean, the US doesn't have the life, the, the longest life quality life expectation in the world. So maybe somewhere else. So it means that what we are counting for and what we are defining as good might not be. We need to go back to accounting and accounting fundamentally and cosmic accounting and understanding and therefore education and therefore practice and therefore understanding and therefore uh, what you call anticipatory design or what you want. The other word thing that I heard here is that we use the word good and bad. There's no good and bad. There are not only things. Even the law cap is just things. The problem is what do we understand what the law cap is? Because if we understood it, we didn't play the game that they want us to play. They want us to be ignorant of a fact and let them play the real game while we are talking and then we are commenting and giving comments and miss kind of leading our brethren. And that's what I take from it, that Bucky could not be called, it could not be liked, liked by the formal structures, no way. It was, it was not possible. And maybe I, I, I draw, you know, like, if you do understand there's a risk for you, and you have to be prepared to take that risk. The risk for you is that of being socially uh, ostracized and, and being paying, paying what is the currency that is the most permissive today, that is immediate gratification. You need delayed gratification and patience, which you might not even see in your lifetime. So that is my, it's like a priesthood, what we engage in. It's really 
a committed thing to continue. And that is a lifelong, uh, a lifelong commitment to education and to practice. That's my takeaway. Steve, how do you feel? What do you take away? Well, I feel really good. I'm excited that we're reading this book together and I hope that the, uh, the next chapters look pretty good. I did my rant uh, before we started takeaways. I did put a link in the uh, chat for that movie, Landscape of Invisible Hand with Invisible Hand. I put a little re movie review in there of it. We are n heading into another crisis it, very rapidly with artificial intelligence and 3D printers. And um, we've really got to change this overview about uh, what being is, what is, what is living. I've been uh, listening to Donald Hoffman and Lex Friedman in a podcast. It's about my third time listening to it. And they're discussing the nature of being. And for sci science has been for hundreds of years if not thousands, trying to discover, you know, create a definition of life and understanding the universe. And Donald Hoffman proposes that the way to understand being is simply to be. And I think that's way beyond <laughs> the comprehension of most people. <laughs> you know, in this movie, uh, Landscape with Invisible Hand, there's a guy in there who's a brain surgeon who ends up working for the aliens as a golf cart driver. And the aliens have they they uh, they do anti gravity. They don't need wheels. They don't need carts. But they think it's cool to have a human being drive a cart for them. So it's one thing it does. And they, and and these people are going up to visit this alien, and they say to this guy, "What were you? You know, what were you on Earth? I was a brain surgeon, and you're driving a cart." And he turned around and looked. And he says, "I make five times more driving this cart than I made as a brain as a brain surgeon, and I'm just trying to feed my kids." I mean, there's nothing about passion of life. There's nothing about being a human being, and mm -hmm. I think that's our future. I hope it's your future, and I'm gonna. I'm looking forward to seeing what resources uh, Bucky's gonna bring to this as he uh, as we continue to read his uh, stuff. Hey, Joe, you gave you put a link in there, but you sent it to me only, and I sent you back a note. I invite you guys to pull down this link on on this uh, movie review. It's probably it's in very, 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 very limited release. It was a Sundance movie, and it, it's in very limited release, and uh, I doubt that it'll be around. It'll probably show up on video in a year, but if you get a chance to watch it, it's really cool. I'm excited that this group, we get to read this together, because if I were reading this by myself, I don't think I get it's much it's fun to kind of look at the words and listen to somebody else read it and then listen to our comments in between i'm getting a lot more out of it than if i would if i were just reading on my own so thank you all very I much love everyone. absolutely yeah. yep thank you so much for your time everybody yep thank you see, see you, you next again week. next week bye see you next week my friends bye-bye